In an earlier video about vintage oscilloscopes, I included the Heathkit I0103, and in the course of that, I mentioned the calibration signal that this scope produces. In doing so, I think I created some confusion, and uh, someone in the comment asked about that. And it, it got me to thinking, it actually is one of those comments that seems fairly innocuous on the surface, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized, you know, I've never really seen anybody talk about this issue. In the old days, oscilloscopes like this one, analog oscilloscopes, had to be calibrated, and there were uh, often a lot of calibration adjustments. Some you could get to from the outside, some you had to take the covers off, and the procedures for calibrating these instruments were sometimes very complicated if you ever uh, calibrated a Tektronix oscilloscope from the 60s, let's say. It was a very complicated process and you did a lot of very expensive equipment and calibration standards and so on. <clears throat> Inadvertently, I mentioned the calibration signal. At the time, I was simply talking about the fact that back in the old days, the calibration signal was often a sine wave. That is, it was derived from the AC line and it was set to a particular uh, height and then it was used for doing some of the various calibrations, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But that's quite different from what happens today. Today, digital oscilloscopes do their own calibration, and we'll talk about that in a second. But before we get to that, let's look a little bit at what calibration entailed in this. In a modern digital oscilloscope, the signal that is often brought out for uh, that I inadvertently call the calibration signal is actually only intended to compensate the probes. We'll, we'll look at that in a, a little later too. But I thought it might help to clarify in the old days the analog scopes actually had to be calibrated and it wasn't just a one-time process. You had to do it pretty regularly. It's a good idea to do that with a digital oscilloscope as well, and we'll look at that in a second. But first, let's look at the old calibrations. And we can do that on this schematic. The areas in gray, such as this, are the calibration or and or front panel adjustments and there were quite a few of them. I won't go into all of them, I'll just kind of pan around here and show you all of the every gray box that you see is either a front panel control or a calibration adjustment. You see them pretty much all over the schematic and this is just a portion of the IO-103 schematic. So the manual has a rather complicated procedure for this particular oscilloscope that involves setting all of these, and this is just the vertical uh, channel. The, uh, of course, you had to do similar calibrations in the horizontal channel and so on. And the reason for that was because of this phenomenon. Let's suppose that you have a resistor divider in the input to attenuate the signal. Generally these were came in a 1, 2, 5. This is just a by 2. So in other words, assume that you had 10 volts applied here and you wanted to divide that in half. Well, you might insert a pair of resistors of equal value here and here. And that would divide this signal, 10 volts, exactly in half, producing 5 volts at that point. The problem is that even if you use fairly precision 1% resistors, this resistor can be 100 ohms high, this resistor can be 100 ohms low, and in that case, you're going to get 4.95 volts at this point instead of 5. So, scope manufacturers inserted a potentiometer in the circuit that would vary from 0 ohms 
to 100 ohms. In other words, enough range to cover the worst difference between these two. There's 200 ohms difference between the highest value this one can have and the lowest value this one can have. So if you put a 200 ohm potentiometer in here, you can basically adjust out those differences. This was necessary not just for kit scopes like the Heath kit, but also for uh, factory manufactured scopes because, among other things, over time, resistor values would drift. So uh, let's look at a, a little bit at that and how that might go about being calibrated. Now here I'm not talking about the calibration inside the oscilloscope. I'm talking about the regular maintenance that you had to do on an analog oscilloscope. This is a drawing of the IO103 front panel and I'm going to focus primarily on the circles you see around the vertical attenuator there. I'm referring to these circles as well as the one over here. Those are holes in the front panel. For example, this one is to center the position adjust. That is the position control for the vertical position. The over time would drift and if you to set it back to the center of its range so that uh, for example when you have this at, at pointed at the nine o'clock position that the trace would be in the middle of the screen you would periodically have to move this adjustment with a screwdriver through the front panel but you also would have to calibrate the vertical attenuator and usually oscilloscopes like this had a calibration adjustment and a balance adjustment. The balance adjustment as you would rotate this knob the trace would move up and down the screen because of offsets in the circuitry and so the purpose of the balance control was to uh, compensate for those offsets, bring them all back to zero so that as you went from say the most highest volts per division to the lowest volts per division, the trace would stay in the center. You would also calibrate so that the indicated value when this vernier knob was fully clockwise was the indicated value. So if it said 10 volts per division, you wanted exactly 10 volts per division. And that was the cal control. And you had to actually go back and forth between these two several times to get uh, a satisfactory result. And that is the purpose that is setting the cow and the balance is the purpose of the one volt peak to peak signal that I referred to in the earlier video. You use this one volt peak to peak as the input signal while you were adjusting the cal and balance, you would apply one volt peak to peak, adjust the cal. Then you would short the input and adjust the balance and so on until you got uh, a balance across the whole range and the calibration within the specifications of the oscilloscope. This was what I was referring to when I said calibrate. Now, in a minute we'll talk about compensation of probes. That's an entirely different thing, although you can consider it a form of calibration. But before we do that, let's look at how a modern oscilloscope does the same thing. This is a simplified diagram of a digital oscilloscope. There is an input through an attenuator, and the attenuator is controllable by the microprocessor. That input, after it's properly attenuated, is applied to an analog-to-digital converter, and then the analog-to-digital converter can apply a correction factor out of flash memory. 
Often this flash memory is inside the analog to digital converter. Sometimes the flash memory is outside, like this, and in which case there is a digital to analog converter that converts the reference signal. In other words, you have an input signal applied to one side of the ADC and the ADC generates a, a digital value based on the difference between the input signal and the reference. So the reference could be ground or it could be a slightly positive or slightly negative voltage depending on the flash memory. So why go to all this trouble? Well, when a modern uh, oscilloscope is calibrating itself, what it is doing is applying a known signal. And then, through the microprocessor, is, is essentially running through all of the different attenuation and other factors on the vertical scale and filling up a flash memory with values that cause the output of the ADC to be correct for that particular setting and for that particular channel. So that's what you see when you see a digital oscilloscope doing self-cal. Is It's essentially filling up this flash memory, either an external flash memory or one inside the ADC. The combination of the flash memory and the uh, A to uh, D converter produces uh, a value in the waveform memory that accurately represents the input even though the oscilloscope itself internally might have a lot of calibration errors but they're basically being taken out by this flash memory. Now of course once again as things change over time you have to recalibrate because the values in the flash memory have to change. So let's look at how we might calibrate a modern digital oscilloscope like this Siglent SDS-1102X that I previously compared to the Rigol. First thing we do is we go to the utility menu and then down here where it says do self-cal we press that and it tells us to disconnect everything which I've done and then to press single which is the acquire button over here, or trigger button, and it begins to do the calibration. Now I won't bore you with watching it go through all of this, but just notice that one of the things it's doing is it's moving each channel through its range, and it does this many, many times. But for now, I'm going to pause the video. Okay, well now we're back. And it's near the end of its calibration cycle. This has taken about uh, two or two and a half minutes. I haven't actually timed it. And now it has completed, and it says press run stop to exit. And so I'll do that up here. And the oscilloscope is now calibrated. Here you see the oscilloscope probes are connected to the compensation signal. You notice that it says cal, but actually it's not used to calibrate the oscilloscope. That's actually a misnomer. It's actually only used to compensate the scope probes because in a second I'll do that and you will see that I do not change the actual calibration of the oscilloscope. What I do is I compensate for capacitance in the 10x probe. Now I've switched to only channel 1 so that I could get a large display. And I'll move in here so that you can see I've deliberately misadjusted the compensation. This is a square wave and so the edge of this should be a nice square corner. Instead, it's rounded. And what I'm going to be doing is adjusting the probe. You may notice right here 
there is an access hole for a tiny trim capacitor down inside. So I'm going to be adjusting that to get a nice square corner on that waveform. You see it goes above and below the square. The proper adjustment point is where it just sits at the square. That is providing frequency compensation using the harmonics of a square wave to set the capacitance of the probe at the proper value to produce the widest possible frequency response for this particular probe. This is a 100 megahertz oscilloscope, the signalant, and we're trying to get a full 100 megahertz of performance out of the probe. Now understand that we're not calibrating the scope. You saw that a little earlier. Instead, all we are really doing is we are compensating the probe. So I apologize for the confusion I probably created. However, it had a positive result, I hope, and that is that it caused someone to ask a very good question that prompted me to, to think about well, why is it that they still call the signal the calibration signal when in fact it's not. It's really a compensation signal. Well, I can't answer that. I think it's just more the fact that when scopes began to be digital, they tried to keep as much the same as they could because they were frankly a little bit startling to a lot of people using scopes, including myself, who had to relearn a lot of what they already knew about oscilloscopes in order to use the new digital scopes. So I suspect they called it Cal just because that's what they used to call it on the old scopes. But it actually has a quite different purpose. In this scope it is a compensation signal and for the reasons that we just talked about it's much better to use a square wave for that compensation signal. Whereas the old days they used a sine wave derived from the AC line because it was not necessary when doing calibration to adjust for a square corner as this does. Instead you were merely setting the peak to peak value on the screen through the calibrate and balance potentiometers. That now is taken care of entirely within the digital scope. So the digital scope does its own calibration now. All you have to do is compensate the pro. So I hope this has been useful and I thank the uh, the viewer for the question. Uh, maybe uh, a similar question will provoke a little more thought on my part or perhaps some suggestions from a viewer about something else that we might want to talk about with regard to digital oscilloscopes and comparing them to some of the vintage analog oscilloscopes. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you soon.